Good morning. Please have your Bibles open to Psalm 2, and we're going to be looking at Psalm 2 this morning. Unless you were hiding under a rock all week, which you might have been hiding under a rock all week knowing what was on the news, we did have an election on Tuesday. And it's probably the strangest election, at least in my lifetime, and perhaps in your lifetime as well. <coughs> Things didn't go exactly as planned, for the most part. Things turned out quite unexpectedly. But we did see a lot from our country. We saw some very good things, participation in voter turnout, but we also saw some very ugly things, some very unfortunate things. And I would be remiss if I did not spend at least a little bit of time today on God's Day talking about that election. A couple of things that we need to think about here as we get started before we get into Psalm 2. The pursuit of worldly power often brings out the worst in people. And again, we saw that this week. We saw that it brings out the worst not only in the people who are pursuing it, but also the people who are following those who pursue power. It tends to bring out not just the worst in those we are electing, but in the electorate as well. Earthly authority is very limited and is ultimately subject to the will of God. That's a lesson that we forget about often too. In the rush to become powerful, people forget that they would have no power at all unless it had been granted to them by God. Of course, that reminds us of the conversation that we recently studied between Pontius Pilate and Jesus Christ. After Jesus' mock trial, Pilate asks Jesus, Do you not know that I have the authority to release you or the authority to send you to your death? And Jesus very calmly responds, you would have no authority unless it had been given to you from above. Presidents, like kings and other potentates, come and go. But our submission to God ultimately determines our eternal fate. And it really doesn't matter in the end who we've voted for, or who's been in power, compared to have we confessed our faith in God and lived that faith to the fullest. And God has already chosen who He wants to rule over heaven and earth. The real question we have to ask this morning is, have you? So with the election in mind and questions like this, I turn to Psalm 2. Because Psalm 2 is God's proclamation of who He wants to rule the earth. For a time, by providence, God may have this king or that king, this president or that president, a dictator or a benevolent individual ruling over a country or a small area, for a time. And those kings and those presidents, those dictators, they come and go. But Psalm 2 is God's affirmation. The Father Himself saying, this is who I want to be the ruler of all heaven and earth. Most especially, this is who I want to rule your hearts. So we begin then as we discuss in Psalm 2 and verse 1. Why are the nations in an uproar and the people devising a vain thing? He says in verses 2 and 3, The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us, it says. Great question, right? As we get started, why are the nations in an uproar and the people devising a vain thing? Why do people get so upset? Why are people so upset about things like elections? And I think I've boiled it down in my limited wisdom to this point. That if you don't have any faith in God, if you don't understand who God is and what His power is and the role that Jesus has in ruling this world, then earthly power is all you have to go with. That, that's the only thing that you have, isn't it? Take God out of the picture and being a part of the ruling class is all that you have. My guy won or your guy won. My people are in power or your people are in power. And so we become obsessed with things like that because we don't understand 
that God is the one who is ultimately in power. And it is His Son who sits a upon a throne. It is His Son who wields the scepter of divine authority over all life. So if we don't have God, what do we have to, what do we have to, to work for? What do we have to live for? But the things of this world, the politics of this world, our earthly thrones and our earthly positions of power. More specifically, why would Jesus Christ send the nations into an uproar? Because we know that Psalm 2 is messianic in nature. The whole psalm is speaking about the Son. The Son mentioned in verse 7, Thou art my Son, today I have begotten thee. The Son who's mentioned in verse 12, of pay homage to the Son lest he become angry and you perish in the way. This is the Son. This is the true King of all things. So why would the nations be in an uproar and the people devise a, thing, a vain thing when it comes to the Son? I find it interesting in my discourse, in my communication with people of the world, that we can almost always get along on most subjects, even politics most of the time. The average person that you meet on the bus, the average person at the coffee shop, the person that you're sharing an elevator with, they're not ready to put they're not ready to get into a fight over politics with you. Really, the average person is not ready to get into a fight over politics with you. But it is interesting that the moment that you mention God, the moment that you mention Jesus Christ and the authority that he has over your life and all life on planet Earth, that's when people start getting very upset. That's when people start to devise a vain thing and go into an uproar. There has been great effort put into the destruction of religion. There is great effort that is put into the downtrodding of faith in our culture, in our world. Great effort put into convincing you that you're wasting your time when you put God first in all things. That you're wasting your time when you proclaim that Jesus rose from the dead to never taste death again. So that we all might be raised from the dead on the last day and enjoy heaven with our Maker and our Savior and the Spirit that guides us through this life. They want you to believe it's a waste of time that it's a fairy tale, that it's not true, that it is a delusion. And the world hates you because of it. Jesus himself said that in Matthew chapter 10, didn't he? On account of my name, the whole world is going to hate you. And if they treated me this way, the master and the teacher, how are they going to treat the student and the servant? They won't treat us any better than they treated the Lord Jesus Christ. And they crucified him. They crucified him. So the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Let us tear their fetters apart, cast away their cords from us. It's interesting to note the kind of perspective from which these kings and rulers see God. Instead of standing with God and his anointed, the kings of the earth would rather fight against God and His anointed. They would much rather choose freedom from God than freedom from sin. Indeed, this is a great misconception that seems to exist in the minds and hearts of people of this world. That if they become religious, that if they become faithful, that if they become believers, that somehow or another, that's going to alter their life in such a negative way that it will keep them from all the fun that they were having before. They believe that religion, they believe that God is the slavery. And yet when you go to Romans chapter 6, notice the way that slavery is described here in Romans chapter 6 and verse 15. What then shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you're slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. And the thing Paul is saying is, either way, you're a slave of something, aren't you? And please understand slave in that first century context, okay? Okay. 
He says in verse 17, But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed, and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Now I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. So he's, he's using a human relationship, a, a human way of understanding servitude. That's why the, the analogy is limited. Now he goes on to say here near the end of the chapter that if you choose one or the other, it comes with a result, doesn't it? It comes with a reward. He says here, uh, verse 22, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he's saying either way, you're enslaved to something. Either you are an unwitting slave of sin, which results in death and eternal condemnation, or you choose to serve God, which results in life eternal. But either way, we all serve something. So when the people of the world, whether they're kings or the common folk, when they say, tear their fetters apart, cast away their cords from us, they don't understand at all the kind of slavery that they're choosing. They say, I don't want religion. I want the shackles of religion taken away. I want the shackles of faith and belief in God. I want the shackles of ancient morality torn from me so that I can be free to live how I want. So I can do what I want. Choose what I want. Express myself however I want. And I don't want your traditionalism, your ancient ways, your hokey religions. I don't want them to chain me down with a fetter or a cord. Well, you just exchange one kind of servitude for another, though. The only difference is that one servitude results in death and the other one results in life. So there's a great lesson to remember here from verses 2 and 3 of our psalm, which is Psalm 2. Great lesson to remember is that the forces of evil in this world are always going to have the market cornered when it comes to positions of secular power. Okay, let's just remember that. Let's remember that whether it's our government or any other government in the world now or in human history, the fact is, and I know that this is a little pessimistic, I'm sorry, but the fact is, that evil is always going to have the market cornered when it comes to earthly power. Evil will always have the market cornered when it comes to earthly power. If you go to 1 John chapter 5, when it talks about power in this world, it talks about how the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. When you go back to Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus is being tempted by Satan in the wilderness, what is one of the things that Satan offers him? Dominion of the world. It's one of the things that he offers him is, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you bow down and worship me. I, I will give you earthly power because, my friends, earthly power is Satan's to give, at least in a limited sense. Now again, I don't mean to sound pessimistic or anything like that, but that's just the fact. That when humans invent governments, don't be surprised when those governments are dominated by human will. When humans invent a kind of society, a kind of economy, a kind of government, don't be shocked. Don't be shocked when it is human will that dominates them. Most celebrities politicians, activists. They stand against God's will in some form or another. And yet, in the face of all of that earthly power and clout, what is God's response in verse 4? He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Now, I don't think that this is an insulting kind of laugh. I don't think that God is being sadistic or anything or that He takes pleasure in people's suffering. This is the kind of laugh, this is the kind of scoff when you have no other options but to laugh and scoff. When all the people of the world with their armies and their weapons, with all of their political clout, backing them up, try to stand against God, all God can do is go, 
<laughs> is that all you have? I mean, what can we do? Think about this, my friends. What could we do? Point nuclear weapons at the sky? What can we do? What can we do against a God who is formless? What can we do against a God who is eternal? What can we do who is a God against a God who is in all places at once? Because he's not physical. We can't take physical weapons and defeat a non-physical God. We can't take temporal things and defeat an eternal being. We cannot take things that are finite and try to defeat one who is infinite and all-powerful. We can't outsmart a God who is omniscient, who is all-knowing. What can we do? And so when we try to say that God is dead or that God has no power or that there is no God or that we don't need God, God just looks at everything. He says, <laughs> you think you're going to defeat me with that? And that's all God can do, quite frankly, without stepping on human free will. Because we do have the freedom to reject just as much, just as, much as we have the freedom to accept. But this is not a funny kind of laugh. Let's understand that. This isn't a joke to God because the very next verse in verse 5 of Psalm 2 says, Then He will speak to them in His anger and terrify them in His fury. So when God is laughing, when God is scoffing, He's not, he's not like watching a YouTube video of two puppies fighting with each other and going, <laughs> they're so cute. Look at that. This isn't a cute laugh. It's not a quaint laugh. To God, it's not so much funny as it is ironic, foolish. And he's angry. He's angry. Think about all the resources that have been wasted on foolish things. Foolish endeavors. Sinful endeavors. All of the resources that you have personally wasted in sinful endeavors. The time that you've wasted. The money that you've wasted. The influence that you let go because you chose to sin instead of standing up for what was right. Think about all that has been wasted by you, by us, by humanity in the pursuit of ungodly things. You don't think that makes God angry? That that frustrates Him? So he says in his fury in verse 6, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Elect whoever you want, but be assured, I have installed my king upon Mount Zion. Now, that's incredibly comforting for us. You might have liked the way the election turned out. Maybe you hated the way the election turned out. Maybe you've hated the last eight years. Maybe you love the last eight years. Maybe you haven't liked a single president that's ever come along in your lifetime. Maybe you've liked them all and you're just not very discerning. But whatever the case, whatever you think about people with earthly power and earthly authority, remember what God has said. I don't care who's king. I don't care who's president. Insofar as I have installed my king upon Mount Zion. Now, of course, God cares who's king and who's president when it affects us in our lives. Of course, God cares about our struggles and our suffering. God cares about the things that we care about, especially as our concerns line up with His. When our cares and concerns are of a righteous nature, then of course God cares. But compared to the faith that He has put the stock that he has put in his chosen king? In the grand scheme of things, how much does one election really change the power that Christ has over this world? I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. And we would do well to always remember that. Clearly, this is messianic in nature. This is the triumphal king over all creation. This is the king of the New Testament as well as the Old. This is the glorified one in the book of Revelation. 
This is the one mentioned in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name which is named. He goes on to say, And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. You notice that Jesus is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name which is named. Not just a little bit above, not barely above, and he's not above only when the president or the king or the potentate has said so. Whether one is a believer or a non-believer, Jesus is still far above all rule and authority. Far, far above it. Verse 7. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, Thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. This is the same verse that's quoted in Acts chapter 13, verse 33, as being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Later on, the same verse is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 5, and in Hebrews 5 and verse 5. And in all of these verses, the writer is asking whether or not God spoke this phrase to any other being but Jesus alone. Who else can say that God Himself, the Father, has said, Thou art my Son, Today I have begotten thee. Not any of us. Not anybody else in history. Not even the angels are considered sons of God in the same exalted sense that Jesus is. Let's consider a couple practical applications. Beginning with the fact that God Himself placed His stamp of approval on Jesus. It would be much more difficult to believe in Jesus if the Almighty, if the Father of Fathers, had not personally vouched for his validity. We might have a harder time believing in Jesus if it was just Jesus' own words. Well, God told me back when I was still in heaven that I was his son and that you need to listen to me and obey my words. Yet that's not the case. There were many who heard the voice themselves, witnesses to the voice from heaven. This is my son. This is my son. There were many who can attest to the fact of God's voice speaking and validating and vouching for Jesus of Nazareth. Ask of me, he says in verse 8, and I will give the nations as thine inheritance and the very ends of the earth as thy possession. Now, if you were a Hebrew reading this verse, if you were one of, a child, of the children of Israel reading Psalm 2, and you read that God was going to give to His anointed all the nations in the very ends of the earth, that, I think, would leave you very humble. Now, we're going to be studying here very soon the conquest of Canaan by Joshua and the Israelites. And at the end of that conquest, they are going to take up their possession. Each tribe and then each family from each tribe is going to take up its possession and live there, and that would be their home but it was, a, had a, it, it was limited, and it had a border. And it only extended so far from Dan to Beersheba, if you will. And here's God saying that when my anointed comes, he is not going to be limited by geography. He's not going to be limited by one place, by a line in the sand or a river or the edge of a sea. His dominion extends to all the earth. Wherever the sun has shown that is the sons. And Israel must have looked very small on a map compared to that. From Dan to Beersheba doesn't sound as impressive anymore, does it? When you consider the expanse of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Verse 9, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt shatter them like earthenware. That is, Jesus was given the authority to judge the nations of the world by His power. Now, if it seems fitting to the Lord to break one nation, then He does have the ability to do it. The strength of the kingdoms of this world seem like nothing compared to the strength of Christ's arm, and no king can stand against Him. 
Therefore, when we take confidence in Christ, it is not in vain. Of course, this brings us back to elections. This is why our vote is important, isn't it? Because when we vote our conscience and our conscience is guided by God's will, then we do have at least some say. If I can be frank with you, I don't want to see the United States of America broken with a rod of iron and shattered like earthenware. I would rather not see my children and my grandchildren live under those conditions. But if God so chooses one of these days to do that, to break our country with a rod of iron and shatter it like earthenware, then so be it. That's His choice. And His choice is based not on some random selection of countries to suffer, but on how we've responded to Him. On how we've responded to Him. So discernment is required. And I believe that verses 9 and 11 and 10, or excuse me, 9, 10, and 11 illustrate that. Discernment is required in how we vote, and in how our elected leaders approach the throne of God themselves, the choices that they make, the priorities that they're going to set for their administration. So he says in verse 10, Therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Now obviously, all of us need to show discernment. All of us need to take warning. All of us need to worship with reverence and rejoice with trembling. That's, that's for all of us. And yet, who is being specifically addressed here? Kings and judges of the earth. That's why I picked this psalm to talk about today. I don't assume that any president ever is going to go to YouTube search for Monte Vista Church of Christ and select today's sermon to listen to. I don't know, maybe he will. But I suppose if Donald Trump was going to watch this lesson, this is the verse I'd want him to remember most of all. Just as any mayor, any judge, any senator, any representative, any sheriff, any town council member, if you have any authority at all, remember that authority was given to you by God and He has asked you. He has commanded you. Show discernment. Take warning. Worship with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Please. Do homage to the Son, He concludes in verse 12 lest he become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. I like verse 12 because it has a balance to it. That on the one hand, there's this warning of wrath, of anger, of perishing in the way. And yet that's balanced with the last phrase of the psalm. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. God does not wield the sword, in vain, the sword in vain. God is not angry in an empty sort of way. You don't have to feel His wrath. You don't have to perish. We have the choice now, just as they did in the time of Joshua, so choose this day who you're going to follow. I suppose which way is your house going to go? To follow the Lord or follow the ways of the world? Take refuge in God now. Now, if you're not a Christian, perhaps you have put too much stock in the things of the world. Perhaps this election has shaken you. Or perhaps you love the way the election turned out. And you put all of your hope into a human being to answer all of your problems. My friends, a human being can't fix what you need most of all. A human being cannot offer to you the solution that is most necessary. The solution that you need desperately, most of all, which is salvation. No matter how powerful a human being is, you cannot find salvation in anyone but God. 
His own Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who died upon a cross to save us from our sins, who was raised to save us from death, who now sits at the right hand of God in full glory, says to you in Mark 16, verse 16, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. So whatever need you might have, let it be known by coming forward as we stand and sing.